What's up, everybody? Welcome to Ripstop on the Record, episode 49. I'm Jameson. Greetings. It is Carter. I am here again. I am also here, and this is Isaac. So today we are talking about stitches and seams, something that everyone has to use, but there often isn't quite enough information on. So we're going to be talking about attributes and things like from the French Feld seam and the Flat Feld seam and French Feld seam. the hybrid seam that we'll talk about later. <laughs> uh, but we'll we'll be talking about this in reference uh, to how often you use these things. So going from like most used to occasionally used to rarely used and everything in between. Yeah, and hopefully by the end of the podcast, you will uh, feel much more confident and able to use the correct seam for the correct application and the correct stitch for the correct seam. Send me on a loop there, Izod. Yeah. Uh, for those of you listening and already wondering, hey man, this is kind of a lot of information. I might need to refer to this later on. We're going to put a blog together. So we'll link this into the show notes or into the description or wherever you're listening. Uh, so go check the blog out and then you can see, you can read all of the stuff that we're going to be saying here basically. But this is going to be pretty awesome because you'll get to get our delightful commentary. As for some announcements today, um, as you can see, we're in a new space. This is not the studio that we were in last time you uh, were on an episode or last time you were listening or watching an episode. Uh, we are in the content cottage, as I'm trying to get it named. Mobile mini is what it's called. We're in a mobile mini. It's in the parking lot at our office. AKA prison trailer. That as well. Honestly, they might not even, when I look at the recording, I don't know if they would be able to tell. Well, besides the background, it's an entirely different color. Well, yeah, we could have just put up a curtain. We should lie. Actually, go back. Don't cut this out. Or do cut this out. Go back and be like, yeah, we're in the same spot. So nothing to report there and see if somebody comments and says. Yeah, let us know what you think of the new digs. <clears throat> if we need to hang some new gear, um, send us stuff if you want us to hang it in the background. As for some other updates, uh, the Community Maker Challenge. You have uh, not that many days left to submit your your project. I want to say 10 days left to submit the thing that you need to solve a problem. It'll get kindly judged by us three, including Avery, but also Matt from Redpaw and Logan from Thermal Lift Workshop. Uh, that's an open maker challenge for anybody. Basically just a big sewing competition for anyone that wants to make their own gear can submit a uh, project that they've designed to solve a specific problem that they're experiencing. So I actually haven't even done mine yet because I'm procrastinating quite a bit, but one issue that I'm looking to solve is world hunger genocide really close herbicide yeah wow uh i'm really looking forward to your projects now for the hunger aspect but to that point actually i was at one of the projects i was thinking of was a cooler it would just solve my hunger <laughs> i was thinking of waterproof underwear too already been done w way too old sure that already has been done do they have waterproof breathable call the diaper <laughs> I'm trying to make an enlightened equipment visp, but it's called the PISP, and it's for, um, well, I'll let you imagine on what that's for. Uh, I'm I'm imagining everything. It's breathable, but also, like, if you're on a, a super long run, like, you know, a couple hundred feet, um, super long. That'll do you it. You could still That'll do it. it. In this weather, this weather, a hundred, couple hundred feet is all you need to sweat. Uh, another announcement, we want to... Welcome William Myers, our new operations manager here at Upset of the Roll. You won't really see him on, you know, customer facing stuff that much with like the podcast. Maybe we'll get him on here, but he's making everyone's orders get out faster and more on time and with hopefully less hiccups. So you'll notice that he's here without actually ever seeing him. But shout out to William. Um, and everyone will be stoked to have him. Finally, like, rate, review, subscribe, comment, celebrate. Yelp review. I don't know. Whatever it is that you need to do that call our show phone us, line. Uh, call the phone line. Just let us know that you like what we're doing. It'd be awesome to hear from you all to see what the podcast means and what it's been able to teach you and uh, what you've taken away. So, are there any other announcements that you can imagine? Um, phase two. Oh uh, well, yeah, we started uh, demolition. Yeah. yeah, we're in the content cottage because the other half of our warehouse is uh, ripped to shreds right now. So we moved out. Kyle got upset with us, um, and he decided to just rip out everything on the other <laughs> side. It's going to be an enormous rock climbing yeah. gym. He actually said we didn't have enough reviews on the podcast, so he tore up the studio. So that's why we beg for him now, yeah. shamelessly. All right. Uh, on, further ado. On, to, on to the, the main, the main part. Yeah.
So we're going to be talking about 10 different stitches and seams today. We've broken those down by the frequency of use that they typically see for most applications. So first we'll talk about the most frequently used. After that, we'll go to uh, the occasional use and then finally the least used. These are all good things to know. Even the least used stitches and seams are not ones that you want to forget about entirely. You just might only use them a couple times a year if you're sewing a lot. First, we also need to define what stitches and seams are so that you can kind of get a better idea. So according to Google, last time I did a Google search for definition, it didn't go very well because that was for bushcraft. That's when I said, uh, <laughs> like, the art of living in the bush. But this definition was way better. <laughs> yeah, Rod loved that. <laughs> yeah, he was a big fan. Uh, so stitches are defined as uh, a single turn or loop of thread or yarn. Stitches are the fundamental elements of sewing. Building on that, seams... A seam is the joining of two or more layers of fabric held together with a stitch. So as we're starting to talk about these, they kind of become a little bit muddled. But if you think about a stitch as just like a single loop or turn of the thread being used in a particular way and the seam being like multiple layers of fabric coming together, you'll have a little bit better picture of what that's going to do. Yeah, it's kind of like if you th – the stitch is going to be the thread that holds your folds together. And however you folded the fabric – are the seams that's yeah. that's one other probably still confusing way to wikipedia. think about it i am wikipedia i know all right so the most frequently used stitches the first things we're going to tackle today are very first one the straight stitch isaac define a straight stitch for us uh well a straight stitch is stitching in a straight line <laughs> <laughs> in short, this is what you already do. It's the yeah. basis of all sewing technique. If you have ever sewed, you run a straight stitch pretty much without knowing. Um, there's not really much more there. You know about it. You know how to do it. But that is the most frequently used thing possible. Yeah. Oh, most uh, most like industrial machines um, just have this one stitch. You know, they have a straight stitch. They don't have a zigzag stitch. They don't have like a cover stitch or any of those other fancy stitches that you know, home machines have, um, cause a straight stitch is really all you need for most things. So yeah. the other thing I was going to say is that what we're going to talk about today are all related to machine sewing, not hand sewing. Cause yeah. there are all kinds of other stitches with hand sewing. I don't know That's anything good, about that. Yeah. No, that was a good uh, clarification. Cause there are all kinds of weird stitches, sorry, weird, different types of <laughs> stitches that you could do with hand sewing. So we're going to use the straight stitch as a time to talk about some of the things that you need to dial in when you're doing any of these stitches. So you know the straight stitch. It's not only to actually talk about or educate you on, but it's always good to check your thread tension and stitch length, depending on what you're doing, whether it's a basting stitch, which we'll get into in a minute, or if you're actually putting things together. But thread, needle, tension, always things to check on and be aware of. Yeah. All right. So for stitch length, when you're using like ripstop nylon around the weights that we use normally we recommend eight stitches per inch i think that's right and then your tension uh definitely look up like a youtube video but a way that you know your tension's off is like um stitches should be flat they shouldn't be like 100 percent in a straight line when you look down at your stitches it shouldn't look like someone drew a sharpie line they should have like a slight skew to them and but they should be tight against the fabric you shouldn't have big loops of thread that aren't connecting you shouldn't be able to see you should be barely able to see the thread from the other side of the fabric um, and basically you just want to turn that dial until you don't see those um, there are plenty of way better guides than the one that i'm giving you right now if you just look up basic sewing machine thread tension problems it'll show you but that's that's what you're looking for are just little anomalies within the line of stitching so the straight stitch turns into the simple seam. Simple seam is when you take two pieces of fabric, you push them together, line them up, and you run it through the machine. So you're using that straight stitch to connect two panels. Now this is, we're gonna take the simple seam as an opportunity to talk briefly about woven versus laminates. We're only gonna talk about this briefly because it goes into a very, very deep conversation, but for our fabrics, it more or less break down into two categories of, of woven and laminates, woven being Hyper D300 or most fabrics than a laminate being something like a Dyneema composite or uh, a non-woven fabric as they're often organized. <laughs> the reason that we talk about uh, this in these two categories is that when 
working with woven fabrics, wovens often kind of heal. So wherever the needle punctures the fabric, the weave will then kind of cover up that hole again, or at least heal around it. Whereas with the laminate, once you put a hole in it, it's there forever. So when you're sewing with laminates and you go to create a simple seam, that's why we do things like taping often, not only for waterproofness, but also for the durability. Um, but it's another time to talk about stitch length as it pertains to laminates. Yeah, so in general, whenever you're sewing, uh, not all non-wovens, but as Jameson said, specifically laminates, uh, you, you definitely want to use a longer stitch length than normal, especially if you're not going to be taping. But in general, um, for the most part, you want to use a slightly longer stitch length so you have less of those holes or perforations along the whatever seam you're creating. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it. For the, I mean, depending on what you're doing, you could use similar stitch lengths. We already recommend like eight stitches per inch is not a short uh, one of much stitch length at all. Um, but you might want to go to 10 or 12, depending on what you're doing, right? You still want to, those panels to be held together and you don't want them to be held together by just tape. Yeah. Um, but you certainly want, like if you're attaching something that's not going to have a bunch of force on it all the time, then it makes sense to do create longer uh, sure. stitch length sure. if you can. Yeah. So I just said that for laminates, in order to sew them properly with the best strength, that you should use a longer stitch length, which is true. However, I also said that a longer stitch length than 8 would be 10 to 12, which is literally opposite of the truth. You really want to have, like, between 4 and 8 because, you know, math. So anyway, sorry about that. Longer stitch length equals lower number of stitches per inch, not more. So apologies. Please don't come find my house and throw eggs at it or anything for my mistake. Thanks. All right. Simple seam and the straight stitch turn into the basting stitch. Isaac, what is a basting stitch? So a basting stitch is uh, basically where you turn your stitch length almost as, as long as it will go. Um, and then you don't want to do any kind of back stitch or back tack, whatever you want to call it at the beginning or the end, because a basting stitch is, uh, basically holding those two pieces together um, temporarily, right? So you want that stitch length to be as long as possible so that when you go back and seam rip that, it's easy to come out. So if we're thinking of in a in a in a in an apparel situation, wow, that was kind of hard to say. Um, <laughs> in palms are sweaty. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> in an apparel situation, when you're doing things like um, inset pockets, right? You want to be able to baste those pockets closed. So until you get to the final construction where you fold everything out and then you go back and seam rip that pocket so that it's open. The other type, I don't know if this is also a basting stitch or not. I've always just called it that is like, let's say you're attaching like the little tabs of like grow grain or webbing at the ends of zippers. Mm -hmm. Like I will sew that, sew that onto the panel first before putting yeah. the other fabric on top. And you never seam rip that, but it's outside of the seam allowance, so it never actually makes it you in. You never see it. Yeah. That's where I use it the most often. It's like another example would yeah. be when you're sewing the ridge line of a tarp. Yep. And you you're going to sew it down first and then bind over that. Um, it's really only there to keep the two panels together. It doesn't have any structural integrity. Uh, and same thing, you still would use a long. I still use a long stitch length even if I'm not going to seam rip it because it you can do it faster. And since it doesn't need to actually be strong, there's no reason to like put a bunch of back tacks in, in that. But I assume that's also another type of basting. I don't know. Isaac knows more about that than me. I but think so. I'd say yeah, that's where I see it used the most. I mean, I, mm -hmm. basically I use that every time I make anything that's going to have like any type of loops or attachments or yeah. I think you could basically summarize it as a mechanism to temporarily hold things together until you're ready to do the final stitch. Like therapy. I like that. The final stitch that we're talking about on the most frequently used section is the top stitch. The top stitch is more of a finishing technique than it is like a construction technique. But uh, Carter, give us an example of where you would use the top stitch. So, I, I mean, top stitch is also used a lot, especially in like finished goods because they're not necessary. But a great example would be like on a zipper pouch like this. You've already technically attached the zipper and it's on there and you could just fold it back and it would be fine. Or like even if you bound the edges, but the top stitch does add another layer of 
uh, what's the word? Like secondary strength sometimes, not always. Like a reinforcement. Yeah, but it also like holds the fabric down and makes it look a lot cleaner. It gives it a lot more shape. Like I feel like when you add a top stitch, stitch especially on like backpack panels or something, like it, it helps the pack keep its shape and its form a little bit better. But I think that's also something where there might be too tight. Like I know in maybe in apparel and other things, a top stitch is not the same. Isaac, is that true? Uh, I think in most situations in apparel, it's more of a decorative stitch. Like um, if you think about jeans, right? The like the gold stitching that you see on most jeans, that's top stitching. Yeah. And in that situation, I I think uh, some, one of you apparel gurus out there can correct me if I'm wrong, um, yes. but I believe <laughs> that uh, top stitching in that situation calls for a different needle, and then you also use a thicker thread so that it stays closer to the surface of the fabric. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. But, yeah, uh, another space that I'm trying to think of where else I would do a top stitch, probably on, like, a hem, depending on where it is. You might want to top stitch around, like, a cuff or something like that to make it look pretty, even though it's completely attached. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Like a hat. <clears throat> that's another spot where there's top stitching, usually a double needle top stitch. Yeah. Um, that makes it look nice. Okay, now we're going to talk about the often used stitches and seams. First is the zigzag stitch. So, kind of like how it sounds, it's a zigzag. Uh, looks like a bunch of zigzags. <laughs> it literally looks like a Z. Yeah. yeah. I guess it's like an M repeated, yeah. which I guess is a Z half. Yeah. More, yeah, I don't know. I didn't go to... I dropped out. Whatever. A zigzag stitch is used for... Stretch fabrics. Is this like a study session or something? Yeah. Okay. I mean, basically. The blank. It's kind of, yeah. <laughs> if this um, is a study session, I need to leave because I never did one of those. <laughs> um, zigzag stitches are great for like stretch mesh. So applications where you need your project to move a little bit. The reason a zigzag stitch works well for that is that if you imagine it being a zigzag and you pull on it, it has space to stretch. Or if you run a straight stitch, there's no place for it to go really some some places use a really long stitch length for stretch fabrics so it has more what more give um but in, in theory a zigzag stitch is probably the optimum way to go yeah Definitely. i mean look, a little bit of a disclaimer though like these are stitches that you're gonna like most people will have access to at home in like a large scale production facility they will have an industrial machine that does a chain stitch which is for stretchy fabrics and it looks professional in my opinion, I, I don't really like zigzag stitch on like finished gear, but yeah, not some has access to that. Some home machines have a stretch stretch stitch uh, as well, like the Singer Heavy Duty. Maybe not the eleven, but the forty four twenty three does have one, and it goes like forward and backward and forward and backward and forward and backward and forward and backward, and, forward and, backward. and it also creates that. The issue is that it's really daggum hard to use because as you can imagine if you're sewing like ripstop nylon with flat elastic or something on it's it forward and back just, and like uh i don't know how to use an analogy that's not really off grid um no, don't worry about it <laughs> let's just say it's moving back and forth a lot in somewhat of an erratic manner and it can be difficult <laughs> to very hold slippery yourself. fabric like you could get your fabric could eat in pretty quickly oh but, yeah for yeah. sure yeah but I, I have i have used it a few times on doing like a pocket like the like uh on the top of a backpack and it works okay, but I'd rather just use a zigzag just in the middle. I think that's like the cleanest way that yeah. you can do it. Um, zigzag is also one that you, I mean, for all these stitches and seams, clear, you know, another disclaimer, you need to be checking your th uh, tension and stitch length and everything, but zigzag stitch is another one where your, your stitch length is going to make the, that zigzag wider and longer. So just as always, I mean, something that we preach pretty heavily here, always test what you've got. Make sure you plan a little bit extra in your projects that you can run test stitches on all these things. Yeah. I just thought of another huge thing that zigzags are used for, which is bar tacks. Yeah. A fake, fake bar tack. Um, as I think somebody pointed out mm -hmm. before, we know it's not an actual like bar tack from a bar tack machine, but it's as close as you can get the whole machine. Uh, yeah. So you, you put the stitch length closer together and the width smaller it, usually and it basically creates like where you have a bunch of thread holding a small piece together. So a lot of people use that for tree straps or like different reinforcements on backpacks and heavy, like heavy uh, pull areas where you think that there's going to be a lot of like, let's say um, 
on your shoulder straps of your backpack. If you pick up your backpack all the time by your shoulder straps at the corners, there's, there's going to be a, like a heavy wear spot from where you're pulling that in the opposite direction of the seam. So a lot of times you'll see uh, d- different backpack makers reinforcing those areas with mm-hmm. either a zigzag or a bar tag machine. Yeah. Next up is the rolled hem. So this is kind of the first complex ish scene that we're going to talk about. Um, the one that we use a lot specifically, you could refer to this in our DIY stuff sack kit video. All of those stuff sacks use roll hems, um, but they get used a lot in general. So a rolled hem, got to find the definition, uh, is defined this way, laying the fabrics face to face, folding the fabrics together twice, then stitching o- over with a straight stitch. So, um, we broke down all these ha- all these seams in ways that we can refer to a few specific things. So the difficulty is is fairly easy for that. You just need to understand your seam allowance, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the strength is enhanced because you are getting multiple layers. There's, there's three layers of fabric that you're going through. Um, and then the, the biggest thing with the rolled hem possibly is that it, cr- it hides the raw edge and it creates what could be a sewn channel. So a, a few tips there, but um, as for a rolled hem, Isaac, what do what what do people need to look for in terms of like seam allowance with a rolled hem? If you're bridging the gap from being a beginner to getting there, what's the most difficult piece about a rolled hem, and how could they alleviate that? So, what you need to keep in mind with rolled hem is that it's going to double your seam allowance. So, if you are using let's let's say half inch for ease of math here, uh, if you're using half inch seam allowance, then you're going to have to fold that over twice, and you're using up one inch of your fabric instead of half an inch. So you need to make sure that you build in an extra half inch or three eighths of an inch or whatever your seam allowance is so that you have your rolled hem um, in within your seam allowance. That makes sense. Yeah. So like if you're baking a stuff sack and you want it to be 10 inches tall finished and you're cutting that at 14 or whatever, if you're doing a squared bottom or whatever, you need to make sure you're adding not just 14 and a half, but 15. Yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, if you're doing a half inch rolled hem. Also, I was I was just gonna say that this is I think Jameson mentioned it, but like this is by far outside of a, like a simple seam. This is a a seam that I use more than any other one, right? Like any anything that you're doing where you need to like add cord in, which could be like the pockets of a backpack or uh, a stuff sack or even roll top dry bag. Yes, or even again uh, like a hammock uses the hammock is only comprised of rolled hems. Down the sides are rolled hems, and on the top are just rolled hems yeah. with multiple layers of stitching or rows of stitching. So it's you could also use it on the inside of a bag to hide the raw edges, and it doesn't have to be a channel, right? You it might be harder uh, to roll like two pieces of fabric together that aren't like of the same piece, but you could certainly you could certainly do that. Yeah, and I mean we're gonna get into it next, but the alternative to the rolled hem is the French seam. So stay tuned. So uh, stay tuned to right now, actually. <laughs> right um, now. French filled hybrid. So there's two stitches. There's the, um, the flat filled seam and the French seam. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have done this. I don't, I don't think we're necessarily the ones that have coined it, but you won't find a lot on If you just Google like French filled hybrid, you'll find some stuff, but it's not necessarily like the most well-known thing precisely. It definitely became popular. It was like the third stitch that or seam that I learned about mm-hmm. when I started making gear because everybody that was making their own tarps and stuff like that all used this seam, which I'll let Isaac explain exactly what it is. I don't know if we should define what a French and a flat felt seam are first or how you want us to do that just so it's not confusing. Yeah, Isaac, why don't you just give us the definition, even if it's a little bit confusing, of the French felled hybrid. So the French felled hybrid is basically... Uh, starting with a French seam. Okay, so with the French seam, you have your fabric um, right sides. Face to face, right? No, uh, wrong sides together. Okay. Okay, so as if you you would be looking at your finished product, right? Uh, Wrong sides together. You're going to sew your first straight stitch. stitch. Doesn't need to be a basing stitch, just a straight stitch. And then you're going to flip that wrong sides. Uh, I'm sorry. Right sides together. Yep. So you're starting, like, if you're looking so, at a pattern, you're going to start by looking at it, running the stitch, flipping it, so you're just looking at the, the coded side or the wrong side of the fabric. Yeah. Because normally whenever we sew, like, a simple seam or anything, we always are working from the inside. Yeah. We make our, our, we put our layer of stitches down, 
and then we flip it right side out to have the finished product. But with the French seam, you're starting it backwards. Yep. Yeah. So you're starting with wrong sides together, run your, your straight stitch, then you fold it out so that your uh, right sides are together, and then you do another straight stitch on the outside of that seam allowance. So you're, the goal is to uh, encase that first raw edge within your second straight stitch. Okay. Does that make sense? And that leaves you with like a little flap that just sticks out. Yeah. You don't need to do anything else. It hides the raw edge. You have two separate stitches, which makes it a little stronger. It protects the seam. Yep. Uh, it's easier to do than a rolled hem for that application because you're you're not like folding. Yeah, you're just sewing. You're still just sewing like two layers together, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to like roll it and then pin it down. You don't need to pin anything down. You're just yeah. you're just sewing a straight stitch twice one on the inside and then one flipped inside out yeah. or outside in or outside right in back linebacker out <laughs> okay so the, <laughs> the hybrid comes in uh with that that flap that's left um the hybrid part is just sewing that down to your pattern piece right so you have like your your seam is here right and then you have like this little flap of your seam allowance and then you fold that down to one side and then you sew that down and that's your flat filled hybrid seam and that does a few things right and i think that's this is why it's the most popular is that it's really easy but it also adds a lot of strength in most directions and it also helps waterproofness and it also just gets that flap out of the way so if you're yeah. reaching in like i don't know i'm trying to think of an example like a chalk bag or something even though that's lined let's say it wasn't you're reaching in something over and over and that flaps in the way it could get caught it's just it doesn't look as good but normally you use that when you really want something to be strong where the panels are going to be pulled uh, divergent from each other mm -hmm. and you like you want to make sure that it's going to hold. So, Carter, you touched on kind of the at a few of the attributes that we're going to talk about with these seams and especially when you're deciding what seam you want to use in certain applications, which would be um, the strength that the seam has, the inherent waterproofness that it kind of has, the seam allowance requirements, the raw edge specific applications and stuff like that. Again, you can refer to all of the stuff in the blog where we'll talk about each one of these attributes as it relates to the seam and then give you specific details on that. But as it pertains to the French Feld hybrid seam, uh, this is one that's notably very, very strong. Where again, if you're looking to pull uh, two panel pieces in the opposite direction of each other, this is going to be one of the strongest. It's mostly inherently waterproof in terms of um, needle holes being covered and there being kind of more difficulty for water to penetrate through. Um, your seam also, allowance is obviously one that you need to be have consideration. So, I mean, it's something that we mess up all the time, even with with straight stitches, pretty or simple seams. Um, but it, well, it, speak for yourself, dog. Well, don't drag me down. <laughs> R.I.P. Me. <laughs> it also helps with uh, like if you're making a like a sill poly or sill nylon tarp. Um, it just makes it easier to have that flat seam uh, when you're running like your seam sealing. Yeah. Uh, whatever, whether that's like Silnet or uh, any of the other products that will seal mm -hmm. uh, seams, it makes it easier to get into all those holes and really fill that up. Do you want me to talk about the downside of it or wait? Uh, sure. I'm feeling the juice is flowing. Go for right it. Now. So the, uh, the downside to that specific seam, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, but it just makes sense since we've already, you know, really gone yeah. over the old hybrid. Um, is that since you have to, since you have this flap, right, you're done with your French seam and now you have, you know, Mr. Flappy boy, just flapping around in the flap, flap of verse. When you, when you, that's similar to the spider verse. Uh, no. Okay. So you, you're going to sew that flap down, but that means that you need to be able to have access to the entire length of that seam. So what happens is just imagine, let's say you're making a round bottom bag, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to have a rectangle that you're going to sew together on the ends, and that's going to make a cylinder, right, a tube. All right, so let's say you do your French seam on that cylinder, and now you have that flap, and now you're going to sew it down. So what happens is, is as you sew down the cylinder, you're going to get to a spot where you don't have a lot of space, and you're going to need to try to maneuver that fabric out of the way so you can get all the way to the bottom of the cylinder. That can be really difficult. Um, Most of us don't have long arm machines just in, like, in the back shed. Well, even if you did, it would still, like, because you're not, we're talking about, like, the fore and aft space, not the side-to-side -side space. So what right. happens is as you, you're basically going to have 
to hold away from the the presser foot all of the material that's on top. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to perform. Like it's not a beginner level stitch by any stretch of the imagination, but it is one that's it's one of my you get it right. It's I like get excited. Best. If Jameson's ever like working not now because he makes way more stuff than me now, but uh there was a time where uh Jameson would do perform this seam and he would get to this part and I'll be like, can I do it? Can I do it, please? <laughs> I really, I just, re- it's really satisfying to sew down the flap and be able to go all the way down. I just think it looks good. But yes, that's the hard part is that it can be difficult to perform depending on how, especially how small your project is. Yeah. <laughs> now for the occasionally used, uh, these are all seams. Well, I guess there's one stitch as well. Anyway, um, Okay, so again, these are things that you really do need to know, but you're not going to use them frequently. 90% of what I make, I just use a simple seam or the ones that we talked about, a rolled hem pretty much. I use these a couple times a year, but they're really good techniques to know. Starting off with the flat felled seam. So we talked about the hybrid Isaac. Define what, <laughs> what the normal flat felled is. Okay, so a flat felled seam is where... So you're going to do your, your simple seam, right? So wrong sides together. Um, no, right sides together, and then you, you, you're going to want to make sure that you have a little extra seam allowance in this situation because what you're going to do is trim half of one of those pattern pieces seam allowances down, okay? So, like, so imagine... One's like, at, this is over-exaggeration, but like one's at one inch seam allowance, one's at like half inch seam allowance. So right. Like they're, they're a little off yeah. center. So you're, but you're going to sew them both at the same seam allowance and then trim down one of those so that it's half of the other. Okay. And then what you're going to do is fold that longer seam allowance over the top of the shorter one and then fold that down. You basically do a rolled hem on top of the seam allowance. Yeah. So like your longer, if you can see what I'm doing here. So your longer seam allowance, right, is going to fold over. Isaac, they can't hear you. You're not in the microphone, dog. Yes, I am. I'm right here. We couldn't. Keep going. I got you. Okay. So your longer seam allowance is here and then you're going to fold it over and then you're going to sew that down. Yes. So for those of you not watching the YouTube video and watching yeah. Isaac's uh, incredibly hand animated gestures. hand gestures, um, just go read the blog. <laughs> yeah. <that laughs> There's no way to do it. But yeah, that's a flat filled seam. Um, all right. So attributes of that seam, technically pretty hard. I don't think I've ever actually done a flat filled seam. It's not the easiest thing to do. It's Yeah, it's kind of difficult. I, I mean, especially to get like when you're trimming that, that one seam allowance, seam allowance correct. Yeah. to trim it like accurately the whole length of your seam so one thing i'll actively admit and maybe this is for all of us uh i mean i'm not like a an apparel expert or like a seam expert at all and i think that's a testament to how much like it's important to know these and know these techniques so that you can put patterns together and so you can make sure your gear is strong but you don't need to be a thread scientist to make gear and so although like we're going over some of these like i'm honestly not exactly sure why you would ever pick a flat felled seam over a French seam hybrid. To me, I've always just used the hybrid and it seems like it does the same thing. There might be cases where you only have a certain amount of seam allowance or something like that. Maybe Isaac can shed some light because he actually has a degree in doing some of this stuff. But I just want everybody to know that like you don't have to like memorize all of these because I don't have them memorized yes. and I'm sitting here telling you how you're supposed to do it. So I just, you know, have confidence. If I remember correctly, the flat felt seam was designed specifically for jeans, right? Yes. So that like outer seam on your jeans, because it was supposed to be like super durable and super heavy duty. And the reason that you wouldn't use the flat felt hybrid instead of the um, flat felt is like bulk is because of bulk. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. The, the French felled hybrid, you have a lot more material in that seam than you do with the, um, flat filled seam because you're trimming down that seam allowance. Got you. So if you're creating something where the fabric's going to end up being bulky, then it's a good idea to cut down on basically half of your seam allowance so that it it's either not as ugly, not as heavy, or the seam isn't as rigid. Yeah. So if you're using like 10 ounce denim, you know, it's for it to be able to go through your machine. Lot. Yeah. That's... Gotcha. Well, perfect. Yes, that is... And I think for us, the reason why we don't end up using that is that we're not making stuff sacks out of like Hypalon or whatever. <laughs> if any of you have done that, uh, show us pictures. Yeah, please. <laughs> and tell me what, what you're storing in there, unless it's illegal, because I don't know. 
Uh, setting off bombs and yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know like, why people use a flat field seam sometimes for tarps or other shelters, but uh, yeah, it just seems of, harder for for sure. Um, for sure. Again, I'm not an expert in that. I'm sure that there are people out there that their job every day is to make tarps for people, and they might have specific reasons or data that suggest why they should use why they use a traditional flat field seam over the French uh, feld hybrid seam. Uh, please let me know what those reasons are, but any of the tarps that I've made that use just have just used the hybrid and it's always been fine. Yeah. So we've alluded to it a couple of times now, but we are going to touch on the French seam now. As you're the resident expert, you got to explain this one as well. <laughs> okay. So it's exactly what I said before with the French hybrid seam. You're just not sewing down the, the flat. What did you call it? The flappy? Flappy McFlappersons. Flappy so McFlappers. in the French seam, you just there's just a flap, and that's just what you yeah. get used to with the French seam. I'm gonna I'm gonna describe it one more time since I kind of botched it the first time. <laughs> All right, so wrong sides together, straight stitch, then you turn it around so that wrong sides are together. Dang it, I did it again. <laughs> so hold on, hold on. So you're gonna you're looking at your project uh, with the right side out. Yes. So, so wrong sides are together. Yes. Is that what I said? You started out right. The wrong sides are together. Wrong sides are together. Put the stitch down, and then you put the right. You flip it inside out. Inside out. Right sides together. Put the right sides together. Do another straight stitch so that you enclose that raw edge within that seam allowance. And then that's it. And that was invented by the French. Yep, just uh, the French. It's actually the national seam of France, which is really interesting. So, I just looked it up. I think it was your first. One of your first days working here, we made you create a video yeah. of how to sew the French seam. And we do a video. I don't remember how good it is now, honestly. No it's idea. It's really terrible since it was like <laughs> first my day. third day here. <laughs> I mean, the video quality was fine. No, probably not as well. We were in the Miami office, so it was maybe even worse. The sewing machine was literally just in the middle of the production the floor. Warehouse. Like People were cutting. There's like cutters right. going on behind Isaac's head. Uh, we do have a video on that where Isaac talks about the French seam and that also does, he alludes kind of to the hybrid where he's like, hey, you can sew this flap down. Yeah. Um, do you have any idea, like you were in those classes, do you have any idea why people, seamstresses in France decided to leave a flap? Because that just seems wrong. I mean, again, it's more for apparel applications. Like if you're using sheer fabrics or like lace where it's a really dainty fabric, mm -hmm. you're you're not going to be able to use some of the other Yes, I said dainty. <laughs> That's not what I'm laughing about. Okay. Um, it's just, it's going to allow you to finish that raw edge while also having as little punctures in that sure. fabric as well, possible. I think the, also the other thing I touched on is that when you sew that flap down, that's a completely different mechanism for sewing, right? So when you're doing a French seam, you're basically just sewing it flat twice. Yeah. Yeah. When you go to sew the flap down, you're now probably sewing inside of a tube which in some patterns and applications is basically impossible to do. That's fair. So you're, you're making the seam stronger and you're enclosing the raw edge, but you're not having to do an extra step that a it saves on like production efficiency if you don't need it to be sewn down. And then also it might just be impossible to sew the flap down. Could you just tape down that flat? Like if it was a film, like a film backed or tapable fabric, sure. like 5 DCF, you could do a French seam and then just tape down that flap so you don't have to stitch it, and you can... You could tape it down, but, I mean, if you're able to get tape in there, you might as well just sew it, too. I feel like taping would be way easier than sewing. You might feel that way, but you should try it. Fair. Because <laughs> it, it's basically the same, right? Like, you're... I mean, you're going you're gonna to tape it either way. Yeah, so you might yeah. as well stitch it and get the strength from it. Otherwise, you're relying on, like, the... Is that sheer, in that case? You're relying on the... So what happens is that as you put tension on a seam on that flap, that flap is going to want to pull up. Mm -hmm. So it's constantly pushing the the tape in the, the opposite direction that it wants to go. Yeah. So it's trying yeah. to peel up the tape all right. the time. If you sew that flap down, then you're it's putting the stress on the yeah. stitch and not the. Yeah. Tape. Well, that's kind of why I asked. I wasn't sure if like if you if taping would actually keep that down or if you'd just be redoing your tape every every trip. It, it would keep it down, and like I do that a lot on some things but if you're gonna if you're just gonna tape it down you might as well just do a yeah. simple seam and tape it if you don't care about strength that's fair because you're just doing that extra step yeah the final stitch that we're going to talk about is the buttonhole 
buttonhole. I'm not gonna lie. High school. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. I've actually never used a buttonhole, but after going through this outline and defining all these things, I kind of want to. Isaac, how would I do that? Uh, so most home machines have a buttonhole setting, um, and basically, basically what you're doing is doing two uh, bar tacks, right? Your quote unquote bar tax. Yeah, quote unquote bar tax. Um, and it's just using that zigzag function on your machine and it's automatically setting your stitch length and your, um, yeah, your stitch length really to the small. right, yeah, to the right size. And you're just going down on one side. So think of a bar tack on one side and then you're doing like a back and forth sideways stitch on the bottom. And then you're going back up like three millimeters from that first bar tack. So like, I don't even know what that is. Like huge an eighth of an eighth of an inch, maybe something like that. <laughs> um, so it's like two parallel bar tacks with a very yeah. small sliver in the that, middle, in the middle. Yep. And then all you do to finish that, if you're actually using it for a button or if you're using it for a drawstring channel, um, you just use your, your seam ripper and you poke a hole in the middle of it. And then you use that little blade on the inside of the seam ripper to cut a hole up to, where that top uh, back and forth stitches, obviously being careful not to rip through, rip through that. Yeah. yeah. So you're just, you're creating a reinforced hole. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cause you're, well, you're also creating like a, it's not really a finished edge, but like you're, you're finishing the fabric. So it doesn't just continue to fray. Yeah, but, right. uh, you can like use that as like an embedded place to put hard. Like if you're trying to bury like a, a D ring in there for lacing or something, or uh, maybe a bad example, but sure. Yeah. Like you're creating basically like an eyelet. Mm -hmm. that's using thread. Sure. So it prevents it from fraying. It also reinforces it because you're going to be like maneuvering that hole, opening it up to put something through it. You see it a lot on stuff sacks and things like that. And, uh, all, and like also pockets where you might have a piece of cord coming out of the drawstring channel that you want to be really strong, but you don't want to use grommets or you can't use grommets mm -hmm. or whatever. And then it's also, I see it on apparel specifically yeah. like backpacking apparel and stuff. You see it at like the if there are hem like uh, cuffs or whatever that need to be tightened down like a rain jacket yeah. or something they use those sometimes. Yeah. Uh, just a little pro tip for when you are making that final cut in the middle of it, if you put a a pin like just a, a an apparel pin, you know, um, at the top of your buttonhole, like parallel to that top back and forth stitch, that will. Um, basically make a stop for your seam ripper so that it doesn't cut all the way through. That's Can you imagine exactly finishing, point. spending like 46 hours making like a fleece hoodie and then you're like going yeah. to, you're putting the hood on That's and you just true. need to do the buttonhole and then you just slide the seam ripper all the way through and just <laughs> cut it, cut like the whole yeah. thing in half. Those are times where I would give up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would give up. What's the, I mean, what's the downside? Cause like I'm picturing like a lighter weight fabric and putting a button like that many stitches in a button like the amount of stitches that are in a buttonhole on a certain lightweight fabric, like just what do you need to be aware of when you're considering adding that? I mean, it's just difficult. It, it should still work. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to mess around with the tensions. There's like on, on, so there are also, I think nowadays almost most mid-level machines have one step buttonholes, which basically means you put on like a special foot and then you just press the foot pedal and it does it for you. But Previously, and then some probably in lower models machines, there are like three step and two step where you actually have to do different parts of the buttonhole separately. Yeah, that's how my machine is. And I think that would be harder, that uh, cool. especially if you're using like a lighter fabric to make sure that everything stays where it's supposed to stay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but you could still do it. Uh, it's just like you said, it's, if you don't need it to be there, then you don't. You shouldn't have to use it. I think the hardest sure. part is just that it's a completely different. You're having to think about where that hole is going to be. Like let's say you're doing a rolled hem and you need it to you need there to be a hole in a certain spot for the quarter to come out, then you actually have to put that like at a certain in spot in the seam allowance to know that when you roll it twice that it'll yeah. be outside. I think that's the hardest part. And also, as Jameson said, we sew he specifically sews and throws his phone across the room if you heard of that. He got really mad at buttonholes. I'm trying to calm him down. But okay, cut this. He's getting angry. Um but no I'm it, angry. It, <laughs> I would, it's I would just say not that, that you, you're not going to use it very often at all. Yeah. I would say that I wouldn't use a buttonhole for anything less than 1.9 ounces per square yard. Yeah. That makes sense. That seems like a good safety measure. I think it also, 
for the uses of a buttonhole, the fabrics kind of match it, right? Like there's not much reason why you should be making a membrane seven stuff sack with, with a with buttonhole. buttonhole. <laughs> right. And so <laughs> most of the time, the things that you're going to make stuff sacks out of are like waterproof or whatever and have a coating on them that would make it easier for the buttonhole to like hold its place. So yeah, don't make like, don't put a bunch of buttonholes in mem 10 or something. That'd be foolish. All right. That pretty much wraps up our stitches and seams deep dive. As I mentioned earlier, you can go check out the blog in the description or just go to our blog on the website or click the link in the bio or whatever, wherever it is that you're finding this, just go find the blog. It, it's, it's around. Um, and you can read all about the stitches and seams that we talked about, all the attributes, strengths, weaknesses, etc. Some would say that it is so interesting. Oh, Isaac, your jokes just leave me in stitches. <laughs> Those were not planned, by the way. Seems that way. <laughs> oh, and we're gone. All right, see you guys. On. <laughs> All right, on that note, it's time to leave. Like I said earlier, like, rate, subscribe, comment, right. review. Please let us know what you're what you're thinking. Um, we really appreciate everyone that listens and and, and tunes in. Yeah, seriously. Um, and until next time, we're just going to leave you hanging on by a thread. The next two episodes are really exciting, though. You're going to want to tune in. Episode 50 is our Community Maker Challenge. So for all those people that sent in a project, you can hear all about them and hear our conversations around those projects and around what we've seen uh, with Logan and Matt. Episode 51, we're talking about the history of MIOG, and we should have a pretty cool guest. See you then, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, guys.